Welcome everybody to this morning's breakout session. Um, the team of this, this session is getting BIM and offsite production to work hand in hand. Um, as of yesterday's session, uh, we have three presentations this morning. Um, and I have the, 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 to the, uh, the first presentation. So um, the title of my presentation is uh, Modern Methods of Construction, a Driver for Increased Levels of Output in the Irish Residential uh, Market. Um, I suppose a kick off initially with perhaps summarising where I see the challenges facing, um, the current challenges facing uh, the Irish construction industry. Um, productivity, productivity. Um, as we can see here on a graph, uh, the red line indicates Irish uh, productivity in the construction sector within the Irish economy. Um, that's benchmarked against other sectors in the economy such as information uh, and communication, IT, manufacturing and agriculture. And as you can see, we're pretty much tracking uh, along the bottom uh, of that chart. So within the, the, the economy, the Irish economy, construction has a very low level of productivity. There's also other issues. Um, and I think those that are currently operating in the industry are very uh, attuned to those. We have significant, recently we have significant rising material costs. We have a severe uh, labour shortage, skill shortage, uh, and and also, you know, I think that there's a, a second or a third issue facing us, and that is particularly from a, a design point of view, it, it's the, the issue of uh, indemnity insurance for for um, design disciplines to to get uh, insurance. I think is, is proven challenging. So we we have a lot of a lot of key challenges there, um, which could lead us to the question, you know, is construction currently broken? Um, so hopefully we, we, we can answer that question as we go through. Um, another key challenge, uh, particularly in, in terms of uh, housing, we're in the midst of a severe housing shortage at the moment, a uh, crisis even. Um, and the, the chart here, uh, the graph here shows um, granted planning permissions by housing type over the last 20 years. Um, now, these are obviously not housing completions, it's just that the, at a planning stage and what, what we see and what we were planning. So you can see during the boom times um, around 2005, 2006, 7, you know, we had significant numbers of residential units being planned, um, particularly around uh, multi-development houses, so the likes of uh, two-storey, uh, three-storey duplexes, etc. Um, and then, you know, a severe drop over the cliff uh, during the recession and we're now just beginning to really kind of come out of that that low dip and out of that we can see that apartments are actually now becoming uh, the mainstay in terms of what's being planned and of course this graph doesn't uh, show um, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, units that perhaps were, were kind of uh, Planning was granted, and then obviously the, the SHD process and, and through the, the, the legal issues uh, may have been um, removed. So I think we have a, a severe housing shortage, which is pushing up house prices, um, rent, etc. So we're in the midst of, of uh, a severe issue. Um, we're also facing one of the most uh, significant challenges, not just within the construction industry, but but humanity actually, um, it, it's the, the issue of climate change. If we look um, at a stark warning that was issued by the IPCC a, a number of weeks ago when they talk about global warming reaching up to two degrees uh, over and above uh, pre-industrial levels, um, pretty much just over a hundred years ago and the impacts of what this will mean. Um, and I think we, we can really see that happening at the moment in terms of um, flooding, uh, Heating, and you know we, we've had record temperatures in Europe uh, over over the summer. Uh, severe floods across uh, Germany and Belgium, and all of this is, is really impacting in, in terms of uh, not just construction but but all of humanity. So we have some real key issues um, that we need to address. And obviously, this this was in the context of uh, an industry with very low um, uh, productivity. And I suppose just in terms of uh, climate change, we can see here it's not just outside of Ireland. You know, I think we, we seem to take the view of, you know, it, it's happening elsewhere uh, and just let's get on with, with, uh, with our own work. But I think here in Ireland, 
you can see that the atmospheric uh, mean surface air temperature over the last number of years has been increasing significantly over Ireland. Um, so again, you know, it's it, it's it's real, it's current, and it's happening. And the Irish construction industry really needs to address this. And I think this is a team running through all of the the, the presentations over the last uh, day and a half. You know, the issue of climate change, and they need to address climate change through digitization and through uh, new uh, modern methods uh, of how we we go about building uh, and constructing and delivering projects. And which leads us on to the question then of you know, what can we do about that in terms of design and construction? Can we look at new modern methods of construction to, to start addressing these issues? And when we talk about modern methods of construction, we're really talking about a range of different um, construction methodologies, not just one particular method, but, you know, they, they range across uh, the spectrum. Um, this is a very good uh, 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 capture of, of that categories, categorization um, developed in the UK, um, seven categories ranging from um, pods, uh, precast concrete, right down to uh, site-led um, labour reduction productivity improvements. And essentially modern methods of construction is a broad term which is used to describe off-site manufacturing and on-site techniques that provide an alternative construction methodology to, to what we're used to in terms of building, uh, building methodologies. Modern methods of construction um, can be seen as a lean construction methodology. Um, and when we delve into the concept of lean, um, we look at the, the, the five principles of lean, which were derived out by, by Womack and Jones. And these principles are, are applicable to uh, modern production and uh, manufacturing. And we can we see that you know, the, um, modern methods of construction can very much align, align to these particularly when we talk about you know, uh, creating flow by eliminating waste. So what we want to do is we want to create the flow of design construction and eliminate all of the wastes. And typically the wastes that are seen in lean, and these have been derived out to the uh, Toyota production system and very articulately put together in um, Jeffrey Riker's book, uh, The Toyota Way, and are seen as the seven wastes of uh, Muda, um, where we're looking at inventory, weighting, defects, uh, and transportation. So if we, if, we, if we apply those to design and construction, so for instance, inventory, we can talk about, you know, uh, at a design phase, it, it's the use of uh, labor resources. So are we applying the right skills to the right tasks? Apply that then to construction, it, it's resources, natural resources, products, materials, et cetera. Weighting, you know, we can equally apply weighting to the construction process. It's, you know, the, the construction programs. How do we program uh, buildings and program construction so that we reduce the amount of weighting that we have just in time deliveries that we can sequence out all of those construction methodologies together. So once we get that correct and right from a design and construction phase, removing and eliminating the waste um, throughout that lean process. And of course, um, one of the key aspects of, of lean is, is what we've seen as Kaizen. So we're, we're pursuing perfection. So we're, 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 we're checking, you know, we're reviewing and we're sitting back and we're analyzing what we've done and, and what we need to do and what, you know, what worked well, what didn't work well and how will we improve going forward. So I think lean uh, very much is, is a, obviously modern methods of construction, digitization, they're all lean processes. So we're bringing both of those together uh, in, in an environment which hopefully can, can help um, and, and tackle those challenges that I outlined earlier. So again, just getting into uh, you know, modern methods of construction, there's a, a number of reports of benefits and I'm sure you all can, can, can run through from his own experiences in, in the next presentation. But we can see improved productivity and innovation um, as a case study on that, um, if we look at uh, the MACE group uh, in, in uh, London, uh, in the, the former Olympic site, where they delivered 482 apartments across two towers in 89 months, disused uh, on-site uh, encapsulation. And if you, if you tuned in this morning um, uh, to the presentation on, on construction robotics, you saw that this technology, this junk factory technology, is not new, it's been used in, in, in uh, Japan and, and the Netherlands. So 
you know, this is not new technology, but it, it's, it's applying it to residential construction. It's enclosing uh, the construction site into a factory, essentially. And that factory jumped up the, the, the building as, uh, as, as it was progressing. And then all of the, the elements within the, the building were all prefabricated and, and componentized and can be put together. So again, we can see here as a, as a real life example, the, the, the productivity gains and the improvements that can be uh, achieved through modern methods of construction. Again, the, the other benefits, reduced environmental impact, you know, addressing climate change. Um, if we talk about uh, the, the, the concept of moving a lot of construction methodologies to a factory-based environment, producing them and manufacturing them offsite, we can see that we can optimize the amount of material usage. We can reduce the amount of energy consumed into building. We can uh, optimize the, the, the construction sequencing, the logistics, the delivery of materials to site. We can optimize all that. And in, in an environment where it's all digitally delivered, where we're using BIM um, to design, uh, construct, um, and sequence out uh, deliveries. And again, as an example, uh, on the NO6 Easter Village MACE uh, project, you know, that uh, MACE were anticipating to, to reduce uh, carbon emissions significantly over, um, over to a traditional build uh, project. Improved health and safety. Um, Again, modern methods of construction, we're moving a lot of the heavy construction activities to uh, a factory controlled factory environment. Um, so the risks associated with on-site work can be minimized. Um, and again, as you can see uh, in, in the photograph, the NO6 uh, East Village site, which used a very innovative uh, methodology where the floor plates were connected, the edge of the floor plates were connected to facade panels, which then were just craned on and lifted in. So we're protecting the, the leading edge there. And actually in 2019, the Irish construction industry, um, uh, health and safety and fatalities jumped significantly uh, compared to the previous year. And the majority of those fatalities were, were caused from uh, falling from heights. So, you know, uh, modern methods construction can certainly improve uh, health and safety. Higher quality, again, we're removing uh, a lot of the site-based activities into a very controlled factory environment so we can achieve those standards, higher quality in terms of uh, workmanship, in terms of um, compliance with certification, etc. And, and they can be all checked uh, in, in a factory environment. Linking this up back up to uh, research that I carried out earlier this year for uh, as part of a master's dissertation uh, on modern methods of construction, particularly focusing in on the uh, the Irish sector. Um, I engaged with the industry um, in, in two parts, one through an online survey and to follow up with a, a, a very focused uh, set of uh, interviews. Um, Looking at the, the results from the online survey, where I was looking at the, the, the benefits of modern methods of construction, and you can see that the, the number one uh, benefit that reported through the, the, the survey was increased levels of early design coordination. So um, I think what we're seeing there, and, and, my, and my taking of this is that, you know, if there's a benefit shown of increased levels of early design coordination, that may prove that there's actually an issue at the moment in terms of design coordination. So in terms of implementing BIM processes, digitization, and getting that design coordination early on in the process in order to facilitate offsite manufacturing, in order to, uh, I suppose, move all of the, the construction activities um, from site to a factory and then tackle those at an early stage, you know, we need to carry out the, the design coordination. And that is um, a scene uh, through the online survey as a, as a benefit. What's interest here, uh, which I've captured um, in, in red uh, through the different disciplines, I broke, the, I broke down the responses through architecture, contractor and clients. Um, and that on the client side, we can see at number two, uh, the reporting improved productivity. However, um, accelerated delivery is seen as a number six. So again, you know, clients uh, responding particularly to this survey are, are saying that they're, they're, they can certainly see improved productivity, but that's yet making its way through overall accel accelerated delivery in terms of construction programs. 
Um, and then kind of jumping on to the more focused interviews where I interviewed, again, a, a range of uh, architect, those operating within architecture, uh, contractors and, and clients. Um, and these, these would have been focusing on very large scale residential products, um, particularly uh, built to rent uh, uh, apartments uh, with two, three, four hundred units in, in each um, in each development. The number one reported benefit there was the faster program, followed by um, uh, increased quality uh, and then reduction of on site labour. Of particular interest and across both of these, actually, is um, increased improved levels of sustainability. You can see here on the, the, the online survey. It's number six, and through the interviews, it's second from bottom. So that awareness and that that improved uh, uh, that knowledge and, and of the, the benefits of MMC, you know, it's certainly not aware or not attuned to the improved benefits of sustainability. If we jump on again to the barriers, so looking at the barriers through, through the, the, the the survey and the interviews, um, again, number one was lack of incorporation at design stage. Um, and again, you know, when we particularly look at modern methods of construction, um, if we're designing um, and procuring construction without the incorporation of modern methods of construction, particularly the likes of, you know, precast or uh, bathroom pods or whatever it may be, you know, at introducing those at a later stage yeah, is a significant impact on the overall project. And I think, you know, that's particularly attuned and that's in as I see linked to the number one barrier uh, at the interview process where we talk about a lack of knowledge and experience and awareness so again the question is at a design phase are we lacking uh, from a designer's point of view are we lacking the knowledge experience uh, of modern methods of construction in order to incorporate them at, at a design phase um, again you can see you know coming up as a barrier skill shortage um, uh, procurement, uh, project procurement methodologies, and and through the interview process, uh, a barrier of capital cost is coming up. So again, this can be uh, linked back uh, to the initial. So if we're saying there's a, a barrier of capital cost, so you know if we're if we're putting together, again, let's call it uh, bathroom pods or or more volumetric, um, there, there's obviously going to be. Uh, a higher cost because we're incorporating more materials. It's, it's getting more done in terms of just single elements. So from a client's point of view, if I just quickly jump back, uh, if clients are not really seeing the accelerated delivery of projects um, and that they're attuned to some elements providing improved productivity, you know, obviously then I think we're, we're not really putting forward um, the, the business case for from other methods of construction yet. So that we can say that a capital cost is actually not a barrier, and that once we start breaking through, um, particularly uh, you know accelerated delivery of projects, and we can see that projects um, are to being delivered overall faster than perhaps the, the, the barrier of capital cost um, uh, will, will, will be removed or will be lower. Um, um, of particular interest again, it, it's the a barrier which you get across pretty much all of all of the, 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 the categories that I looked at uh, is at the bottom reduced design quality. So you know we're, we're not you know it's not seen as we're trying to build identical buildings that it's impacting on the, the design aesthetics of a project that you know we, we can work with 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 what's there but we, we need to be tuned to um, the awareness of what's on the market etc so that we can incorporate the that uh, at an appropriate level uh, within the design uh, phase, so it doesn't impact on design quality. And uh, putting all this together in terms of just particularly an interview uh, thematic analysis chart, um, and looking at the general teams coming from the interviews, uh, where we look at uh, ad adoption, barriers, categories, and benefits, um, and the drivers. Um, so if we just focus in on the drivers, so what do we see as a, as a driver to greater uh, adoption rates of modern methods of construction. I think what was coming through was early contractor engagement, uh, environmental sustainability and governmental policies. So if we focus on say governmental policies and environmental sustainability and look to other countries uh, and see how they may have kind of uh, incorporated these within their own processes uh, to improve 
increased levels of, uh, uh, of adoption of MMC. And we look at Denmark, which has a high level uh, of, of MMC adoption. Um, you know, Denmark have strategies for circular economy thinking, uh, the reuse, uh, recyclability of materials. They're also looking at um, incorporating uh, embodied energy carbon targets within their national building regulations. And, and in fact, Denmark was a very innovative uh, country, I think post-World War II, uh, they started up um, an innovation centre in, in, in the university in order to, to, to bring on modern methods of construction. And I think that led on to precast concrete becoming a mainstay in the construction industry uh, within Denmark from pretty much the, the, the 50s right up to, to the current day. Um, and then we look at productivity within the Danish economy. Yeah, um, uh, this is just a general level of, of uh, productivity across the entire economy. And we see in blue, the middle line, that you know, this is the, the, the standard EU 27 country rate. We can see the, the green line, which is Ireland, is, is tracking under uh, that, that standard uh, EU rate, and Denmark is, is, is over that. And also Denmark has digitized their planning process, and they have a very, very high rate of digital uh, BIM adoption within the industry. So moving to um, national policies and environmental sustainability, linking all those together, we can see actually that doing that contributes, in my view, to, to improve productivity within the economy. Um, coming back to Ireland, um, as, a, as a driver, we can see the National Climate Action Bill um, was uh, long, uh, signed into national legislation uh, a couple of months ago, and that's targeting a 51% reduction in carbon emissions um, over the next uh, nine years compared to 2019-2018 uh, levels. And that's going to have a severe impact and a, a benefit, I guess, in terms of uh, reducing um, carbon emissions across the entire economy is not yet uh, defined out in terms of sectorial levels um, and that's coming in the next week or so uh, from government so you know what will the construction industry need to do in order to to play a part uh, with, within that overall 51 percent reduction um, in carbon emissions um, and it's going to be challenging and, and challenging for everybody within the industry so if we're if we're talking about um, uh, a method of construction, of design and construction that really targets, you know, the, the, the potential to reduce uh, reduce carbon emissions, reduce uh, material wastage. I think, you know, we, we, we can start linking up uh, that in terms of uh, in integrating it within our, our uh, procurement and, and construction methodologies. Again, just focusing in on that, um, you know, this is where we're going. If we look at the, the built environment across the global economy, um, the, the built environment contributes 39% of all uh, global carbon emissions, um, and that's broken down into 28% of operational energy and 11% of embodied energy. Operational energy, you know, in terms of how the building operates uh, post-construction, uh, we heard uh, yesterday talking about digital twins, analyzing data and collecting data so that we can optimize the operational energy. But again, if we focus particularly on the embodied energy, and if we look at the, the, the life cycle of, of a project, particularly at design phase, so if we're saying at design phase, and this in my view is the critical phase that we need to start addressing uh, embodied energy. As designers, you know, it's, it's our responsibility. We dictate how the building is put together in, to a certain degree, what materials are used, but do we know the embodied energy of the materials that we're using, which will be, you know, dictates essentially the raw materials, the processing, the mining, the exploration, all of that energy that's used um, to uh, that process. And then moving forward into construction, uh, into the production phase, the methodology of putting those together, um, and then the, the, the sequencing, the logistics of uh, optimizing those. So if we're fostering an environment within the construction industry where we're really tackling uh, environmental sustainability and how we design, build, and procure uh, projects. We need to start linking those that production and that design system together, uh, and and optimizing it so that the designers will know the, the impacts uh, of material at uh, materiality choices. They know the impacts of construction methodologies. They're picking the correct construction methodologies, and what does that actually mean in terms of procurement methodologies? 
uh, etc. And if we look again at uh, governmental policies linking up environmental sustainability in the UK, um, you know, the, the UK bodies have uh, uh, linked the procurement of housing to modular construction in order to achieve the reduction in carbon emissions. So, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. This has been done uh, elsewhere. And I think, you know, as, as in national policies, we need to start, we need to start looking at this and, and be mindful. So coming close to the end, you know, what does all this mean really? If we, if we want to create a construction industry that decarbonizes construction, improves productivity, and as a result, increases housing output, and whilst also improving health and safety and well-being and producing high quality projects, essentially we need to place sustainability at the core of how we design, procure and construct buildings. We need to challenge the normal uh, value chain. So what does that actually mean, challenging the normal value chain? You know, looking at procurement methodologies, um, we're using very modern new methods, innovative methods in terms of building, in terms of even, you know, we look at BIM processes, but we're all those are put together in a very traditional uh, contractual procurement methodology where we're working, where designers are working in, in uh, isolation. There's a siloization within the industry where designers are, are working uh, in separate processes to, to contractors and not optimizing um, that those processes in terms of the linkage uh, between selecting the, the, the correct construction methodologies and optimizing that process. And that leads us to, to increase collaboration and less address, adversarialism with the industry. We become a collective um, delivery method of, of designing and procuring, delivering buildings. And then we can start pre-manufacturing more value. So we can then deliver, you know, modern methods of construction, we can move those to a manufactured factory environment where we start pre-manufacturing all of the elements within the, uh, the construction phase um, insofar as possible, and then bringing them to site where we're optimizing that value throughout the, the, the um, life cycle uh, phase of, of a built asset. Um, this needs to be delivered through cohesive governmental policies. So we need to start linking up uh, environment policies such as the, the Climate Action Bill to uh, construction procurement methodologies. You know, we need to deliver new procurement methodologies, not just at government level, but those organisations that are uh, developing uh, contractual um, models, etc. We need to train and upskill, you know, the, addressing and adopting modern methods of construction um, we we'll certainly need a, a new training and upskilling uh, and we, we'll move a lot of on-site skills to a factory environment. We will, again, at design phase, we need to, to create more awareness of, of modern methods of construction and the impacts. And then lastly, uh, or in some, we see critically, we need to, to look at supply chain capacity. You know, we have a fantastic ecosystem uh, of small SMEs within Ireland. Um, I think you see from the next presentation, the, the innovative and uh, you know really energizing as, as I see it, um, methodologies coming from coming from the, the supply chain. But again, if we have to deliver large scale uh, uh, housing output, do we really have the supply chain capacity there to deliver that? And if not, what do we need to do in order to get that supply chain capacity? I guess it could be seen as a, as a chicken and egg, but do we need to incentivize that supply chain? What do we need to do to build and, and foster that, uh, particularly the SMEs, you know, to, to participate in, in uh, developing a uh, large scale output of, of residential uh, development? Um, and with that, uh, I conclude my presentation and uh, we're going to jump over uh, to Michal uh, Kion. Um, who is a director with Modern Homes Ireland, and, and uh, the title of Michal's um, presentation is Can Ireland Deliver the Stable Quantum to Sustain a Viable Volumetric Offsite Industry? Thank you.
Hey everyone. Uh, thanks a million for um for, for that introduction, Pat. I think uh we're we're probably very aligned in what we're saying and very aligned in, in what the presentations are, are running through. So I'll, I'll, I'll clatter on pretty quickly with that, some of the um the, the slides. Um so as Pat was saying from a safety perspective, you know, manufacturing and I, my focus at the moment and in this discussion is is whether Ireland can can deliver that sustainable quantum. Uh, to have a proper volumetric offset industry. Um, so, so when we start to look at some of the stats uh, against what Pat was saying, when you look at manufacturing, in, in theory, it's about five times uh, safer than, than traditional construction. So um, that's across the EU and the US, very similar figures. So from a safety perspective, you know, instead of trying to build uh, a first of a kind all the time in a construction site, it's a many of a kind in, in a factory environment. Um, as, as Pat has mentioned, again, just around the, the energy uh, consumption or the embodied carbon and the environmental impact, you know, construction is a third, over a third of all waste generated. Uh, uh, offsite manufacturing reduces that and, and we've tracked it in the factory at over 80%. So there's over an 80% reduction in waste, which is which is phenomenal. And, and, and from a, a global perspective with regard to environmental change, it's really important. And when we look at embodied carbon, we're generally reducing our embodied carbon on the project by 40 to 50% at a minimum. So again, you know, fairly significant uh, uh, numbers. If we look at some of the UK stats from four and five years ago, and our, our Irish stats follow, follow, follow the same trend, the people that should be coming out of trades now don't exist. So if, if there was a, 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 a skill shortage a couple of years ago, it's actually only amplifying at the moment because uh, the situation that we're having is construction is ramping up. Um, obviously COVID has had a massive impact, but construction is ramping up um, to a fairly significant level and the tradespeople just aren't there. And I think anybody who's on this call uh, involved in the industry will know that, that it's, it's really, really difficult to get with great tradespeople, but there's, there's just not enough of them. And then you look at the statistics of offsite delivery, and this is one of uh, Mark Farmer's slides or Mark Farmer's stats, um, and I'll reference him and Mike that a, a little bit later on again. You know, but as a, as an industry, if we're producing things that are more often than not late, you know, two thirds of all projects are late, and um, almost a fifth of projects are over six months late, high rise buildings. So it, it's it's kind of. I suppose, a condemnation in the industry, really. And as Pat had said, from an efficiency perspective, offset manufacturing is, is, is much more efficient. With regard to quality, you know, I think people are starting to see offset manufacturing as that proper precision engineered solution, as opposed to prefab, you know, because what we're trying to sell um, to any of our clients um, and what people are coming back to us on is, is we have a 48-step quality uh, um, NSA approved process, and we'll, we'll run through that uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, so, what would, would the target be? The ultimate target would obviously be to be similar to, to the Japanese market, but we don't have the same quantum as the Japanese um, uh, 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 offsite or, or housing industry uh, because. You know, if you're delivering 40 or 50,000 units a year from a factory, very easy to have full automation. Um, we show a little bit of that in oil in the US. But, you know, if you look at Toyota Homes, uh, Sekisui or Chemical Corporation, Toyota, obviously, the car manufacturer in Panasonic, you know, the, the number one user of, of Panasonic goods in Japan is Pan Homes. And um, they're, 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 um, their off-site volumetric housing uh, business. So it, they're utilizing all of the, the, I suppose, the trends and the Kaizen uh, and technologies and, and um, uh, that, that Pat was referring to earlier. So just to look at, you know, I guess, what we're doing, and some people may have seen this before, but, you know, we roll our own steel. So um, uh, we take a raw roll of steel, bends it, profiles it, temples it, cuts it, and gives it a unique code. Um, and then the guys are effectively putting it together like mechanos. So walls, floors, ceilings are going together here. Um, and then we erect those walls, floors, and ceilings into a modular box. Um, and the guys proceed then with the first fix works within that modular box and then each activity. So the, the modules roll through the factory. Every activity has a new quality check, has a new um, stage in the factory, and it takes about 15 days from, from a raw roll of steel to having modules um, that are complete and wrapped and out the door. 
Um, so, you know, depending on the unit, we have floorless ground floor modules, which is which is what this is. We can have floor ground floor modules. You have uh, your kitchens installed. All of your windows are in DPCs or on your lateral restraint design. Your PIR is in. They're very much finished units. They're you know, generally about 90% complete going to site. And one of the key aspects for us is obviously design. Early involvement with design, but also managing the parameters of how much can we get finished in the factory. We want the thing to be as finished as humanly possible when we're leaving, when it's leaving the factory. So obviously the there's a constraint around the, the transport and trying to make sure that units are less than 14 meters long and less than 4.3 meters wide. Um, then just from an efficiency perspective, you know, this is a project that was a reasonably awkward um, uh, build in Island Bridge in Clancy Key. It's just, I, I suppose you have a listed building on the, on the screen on the right hand side, the left hand side is a river and the, there's a, an apartment block either side. Of it. Um, so from our perspective, we had a, a reasonably difficult site. Um, so what we looked at, it's 20 two bedroom apartments. So the first module you see landing on is two bedrooms. The next one's the kitchen, living, dining, another kitchen, living, dining, another two bedrooms. And then the, the longest module in the center that you see is the actual uh, corridor. So within these modules, we have all of the internal finishes done, all of your laminate flooring is done, all your kitchens are in, sanitary wear is in, tiling is done. They're as complete as they can possibly be and they're externally accessed uh, uh, units. Uh, so we hung the balconies uh, off the modules as we lifted them in, so that and there was that we didn't have to work over the river trying to, to, to lift the balconies on afterwards. So a five-story building, and it took about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Um, so I suppose from a speed perspective, it gives a, a flavor to the, the potential pace of the units. And obviously this is following all of our fire details. So you can see the guys rolling out Rockwell and various different fire bags um, as the units are getting lifted in. Um, and we had a storm in the middle of that uh, project. So kind of demonstrated a little bit. Uh, what we'd like to see, and, the, and, and I think Ibrahim is probably going to touch on some stuff here, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more advanced than, than I can explain. But if you look at uh, what we're seeing in the industry, we are seeing software coming out now that has a lot of parametric uh, information in it. Um, you know, very, very advanced software out there um, where we can pre-populate uh, modular designs within units um, and automatically fill that site and, and do multiple um, levels and layers of analysis on those sites. Um, so when we look at some of the uh, uh, potential within this, it, it gives us, uh, I suppose, a massive opportunity to, to evaluate the various different elements produce module types and then configure them and then adjust it, configure it, reconfigure it and run a, a large volume of parametric options and embed the commercial information in it. And then from a developer's perspective, from a main contractor's perspective or a designer's perspective, you have something that you can compare um, and you can compare many versions of it and run through all of the commercial uh, elements, the efficiency, um, the, the, the module mixes, and then obviously the, the efficiencies with regard to circulation spaces and all of those types of things. Um, the, the, the target is, is, is probably along the lines of a full automation piece. Um, I'm not sure that we can get there just at the moment without having guaranteed supply. So from our perspective, the big thing in the factory is making sure that we have guaranteed supply. We have a large volume uh, that's running through the factory so we can make the investment into robotics and automation. Uh, and we get onto that in, in, in a couple of minutes. But the robotics and automation is absolutely and utterly critical. It's easy for the guys in Japan uh, when they have such a large volume to have ghost factories and lots of robotics and automation. But what we're seeing here is these robotics are automatically uh, lining out the studs, screwing together the, 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 um, uh, the studs and, and, and the sole plates and head plates. Then they're coming along with the boarding uh, and they're auto automatically gluing and screwing the boards on. So this is absolutely feasible. It's not brand new technology. It can be done. No, it's, it's, it's supposed to be slightly different in an LGS uh, context, um, but it takes investment and it takes a, a, a definite supply chain. So we need a, a volume of supply that is coming into the factory. So how can we get there? And I suppose from our perspective, what we look at is, you know, certainly we'd be trying to learn from the UK and what those guys are doing. They've committed to 75,000 new homes here in construction by 2030, which is a, a really significant amount. Um, you know, that's 25 to 30% of the overall demand in the UK. Um, and this is true, kind of some of the, 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 the Mark Farmer and Mike Dash, um, 
uh, uh, reports. Um, and we think that if we mirror that in Ireland, you're probably looking at somewhere between eight and a half and ten and a half modular hoses by 2030. So we're starting to see a little bit of it. The LDA seem to be pushing a little bit. The AHPs have definitely delivered. We've delivered for Clued and Tua, um, and Clued are very forward thinking in this space. They've done uh, a couple of um, 3D projects now, uh, and they're sending them out for tender. Um, and then we've also seen private developers. We're working with a number of them, and Glendale being one of them, you know, strong proponents of offsite manufacturing. And then there's some ancillary benefits. So we've spoken about the health and safety, the quality, the environmental, all of that type of stuff. But if you look, there's actually ancillary benefits. Each each factory, uh, and, and to deliver that quantum, you're probably looking at maybe five to six factories uh, across the country. Um, generally, they're in rural locations. That's where they are at the moment. They're in Tipperary, Wexford, Belly James Luff, and Cavan. There's ones in Galway. You know, the, the, um, so typically, they're in rural or remote locations. And, and if we can deliver that quantum of, 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 of new factories or uh, accelerate the factories that we have, um, you're probably looking at generating about 3,000 direct jobs in the factory, and then probably somewhere between three and a half and 4,000 related jobs in the locality. You know, that, that you're probably looking at about 7,000, you know, six to 7,000 uh, jobs in rural locations and high quality, stable jobs in rural locations. Um, so. That's my presentation. If there's any questions, uh, please please uh, uh, shout or um, ask them. Hi, everybody. Um, I think Michal and me need to, to drop off before the end of the session. So I think um, we might just quickly just take one particular question. Uh, to take uh, one particular question um, to Michal and, and think it's more around certification and how um, modern Ireland, our modern homes Ireland deal with the, the, the NSAI, for instance, of, of certification of products and, and is there something there that we need to, to start upscaling and addressing in terms of integrating building control um, and certification into, into the on-site uh, manufacturing process? Yeah, the certification NSAA works really, really well. Fantastic, you know, system takes time, takes a lot of money, a lot of fire testing in particular. Um, what would be fantastic if there was a, maybe a small bit more uniformity across the various different jurisdictions from a fire perspective, but I think that's in general construction. But by and large, that's working quite well. Um, but it could do certainly with a little bit more um, certainty around, uh, you know, if you have a fire test for 90 minutes or two hours, it'd be great if we knew that as soon as that goes in, that's automatic food, you know, so there's a little bit of, um, I suppose, certainty around it. That's good. And, and just again, there, do we need, you know, do, do we need to, to bring in more standardization, more standard certification within the industry in order to, to push this forward and, and get greater adoption levels? And, and perhaps move away from the legacy issues that we might have seen around uh, prefabricated construction, et cetera. Yeah, definitely need to design, uh, work with designers a bit more. We definitely just need to, to, people need to see it more, need to feel it more. And I think if there is going to be centres of excellence built in Ireland, and there's a lot of talk around that, I think it'd be a big help. People can go, feel it, see it, um, and experience it. And I think that would be a, a, a big uh, Kickstarter for, 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 for us. Okay. Thanks, Mihal. And um, we move on to our next uh, presentation. Um, uh, Ibrahim Matwa, uh, who's a professor in digital construction and building information uh, modeling at Ulster University. Um, and the title of the presentation is BIM based parametric adaptive design for kinetic shell facades in buildings. So let's just hand over to Ibrahim.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session. Uh, my, my presentation is about BIM-based parametric adaptive design of kinetic shell facades in buildings, as you can see the title. And the paper actually investigates the technological advancement in kinetic shell structures, it examines different kinds of adaptive kinetic shells, and proposes a BIM-based workflow uh, to test adaptive kinetic uh, facades for uh, buildings to enhance uh, sustainable performance and to reduce solar radiation intake uh, based on the location of the building and the time uh, of the day. Uh, quickly, if we talk uh, generally about adaptive architecture uh, these days, actually uh, the rapid technological advancement uh, actually allow modern design processes to start and to consider a building adaptation to the changing conditions of usage and the environmental changes and the changes in user behavior as well. And the concept of uh, kinetic architecture has changed architectural design uh, approaches to be more transferable, dynamic and interactive. Uh, to achieve this type of objective, the, the different design objectives. And uh, this paper, as we mentioned, we will, uh, will actually uh, uh, introduce this uh, workflow uh, to have a methodology, consider building and implemental factors uh, to design kinetic shells that enhance sustainable performance of buildings. Uh, and the methodology actually uh, is based on uh, kind of different factors considered and uses uh, visual programming languages uh, uh, Rhino, uh, Rhino uh, Grasshopper. Uh, if we talk uh, traditionally, historically, you can say back to the adaptive architecture as a concept. Uh, you can f see from historical buildings, which of course are not that advanced as we can see now, mechanically, I mean, uh, you find examples from history which have been, have used facades to other than uh, building, I mean, appearance, to look at the building appearance, but also uh, to um, be used for uh, military purposes for uh, uh, water traffic for, so different things actually can uh, have been used before in, in, in history. And uh, if we uh, look at other examples, a little bit more uh, modern, you can say in the 19th century, 1935 have shown a great change in the means of using uh, rotating kinetic architecture. And this villa uh, was uh, built in Italy in 1935. And the structure was quite unique at the time, of course, which allow uh, the movement of the building uh, rotate around the sun uh, based on certain technology, as you can see. And the idea of having this type of kinetic architecture start as well to uh, flourish over years. And you find here uh, different, uh, you can Currently, you find different buildings around the world, like the Space Needle in Seattle, for example, who have as well this technology embedded. Uh, for, for this paper, we have looked at a number of uh, buildings which we investigated in much more detail, modern buildings, if you can say, to analyze the impact of using the systems on building performance. And the, the analysis actually will be a kind of guidance for the, the study to uh, develop this workflow, design workflow. Uh, so these five buildings uh, have different uh, technologies to be used for the facade and the purpose of facade, as you can see here, some of them are related to natural light control, others for uh, solar radiation uh, protection. Uh, so for the for one of the buildings, for example, this Arab World Institute in Paris uh, uses uh, what you call it, uh, mashrabiya diaphragms that are controlled through uh, pre-programmed settings to control uh, daylight transmission and to attract, of course, audience has a kind of special shape uh, based on the Arab traditionals. Uh, and these diaphragms allowed light to penetrate partially uh, into the building. Uh, and each diaphragm has a series of uh, photoelectric cells, uh, like diaphragms of the cameras uh, that can open and close based on certain mechanisms. And of course, this has of course a lot of consideration for the mechanical work and how it can be controlled. So we have here, for example, this uh, system. As you see, I mean, uh, just an image of. 
how, how the, the, the cross section of each of these diaphragms. And this building, for example, the south facade of this building uh, has uh, 240 units of these diaphragms. And it allows the mechanism to set to perform uh, a maximum of 18 movements a day, according to the design of this uh, system. The other buildings, uh, as you can see here, uh, Nordish Embassy in Berlin, and the, the uh, which include which has a long stainless steel and the cover band to uh, which are controlled to all, to allow movement uh, uh, according to the daylight and uh, the the the. Uh, the indoor and outdoor uh, temperature. Uh, also, uh, the, the Australian building, the Australia house, uh, the council house too, uh, which uh, the, the facade made of system of timber louvers, and as well the, the Al Bahr uh, towers uh, in, in Abu Dhabi, which has the dynamic sun shading units, uh, and each unit has a, a linear kind of equator to uh, protect the building from excessive exposure to uh, solar rays. Uh, for, for our methodology, uh, we, we have uh, uh, kind of defined what type of input data we need to, to uh, run this workflow. And uh, the, the purpose, of course, is to enhance energy simulation of buildings uh, with this type of facades. And the workflow utilizes BIM parametric design uh, principles that provide the possibility of modifying parameters without the need to create uh, full models. Uh, and it aims to optimize the best solution to balance between daylighting adequacy and the internal or the thermal performance uh, of the building. And the, 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 the adapted parametric algorithms will, will allow customization of components in the system or the facade system in order to release the, the best anticipate energy and provide the, uh, the needed amount of daylight in the building. Uh, of course, the, the concept of design by this way uh, have been, of course, developed over years. And uh, if we look back to the CAD implementation during the 1980s and these sort of things, so which allow this type of uh, uh, integrated design to can happen to produce full 3D models of buildings. And of course, this have been developed further by the, the concept of algorithmic design, uh, which was defined as a programmed based approach to design uses algorithmic processes to generate highly complex geometrical shapes, uh, which allows architects to efficiently uh, comprehend and al analyze complex, uh, complex geometries using algorithmic processes, uh, flexible series of commands and logical uh, procedures. So this is the, 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 the meaning of what we call algorithmic design. And, uh, uh, of course, the, the development uh, of BIM technology and uh, uh, the, the programming associated to the BIM technology actually make this much more uh, adaptable, and we can we can use it uh, this way. Of course, still need to have some efforts to program your your uh, your design workflow. Uh, so here you can see here a different type of input data we use, and this type of analysis uh, design analysis that uh, should be done or will be done through this workflow and the output of, of the, the, the workflow, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the, the process, as you can see, is iterative and uh, it, it stopped when we reach to the optimum solution that achieved the, ob the objectives of the design. And uh, here we, we, uh, uh, we, we have different type of uh, uh, components we have uh, checked or tested through this workflow. And uh, one of them is what you see is cells, uh, the cell mechanism. And uh, so we designed the cells so that can be uh, used for the facade uh, based on this uh, mechanism. And of course, there is mechanical kind of uh, technologies that can control the movement uh, of, 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 the, of the cell. So we have here the surface of the building will be divided into square cells, as you see, and uh, the, the central point of this cell uh, is the point which is, is movable. And when, when it moves, actually, it makes different type of uh, opening to the building, so to, to the to, of the facade, to allow daylights and uh, 
to, to penetrate. And uh, of course, it comes with issues with maintenance and with the development of the technology, but uh, it, it has been actually developed and we can find technology related to that. Just it, it needs to be designed well to be uh, linked with the, with the uh, different type of environmental data. Uh, and uh, uh, as we can say, I, as we have seen that there's architectural uh, component or artificial analysis so that should de determine the optimum dimensions of these cells and then the analysis uh, the solar analysis can be conducted and then the structural analysis uh, as well can be conducted so that uh, the, the solar analysis uses the architectural design uh, to produce 3d models uh, with, with, uh, with building performance analysis and the structural analysis is actually supporting uh, the, try to uh, uh, design the structural braces uh, and the structural walls which will be fixed to the slabs of the building to in order to sub, in order to support the facade so all of this have been uh, programmed uh, through this uh, programming uh, languages through a uh, grasshopper file and we have applied this workflow on a case study building uh, which is here uh, you can see this is one of the case study. There is another one as well, which has been detailed in the paper. Uh, and we have tested two type of, uh, of, uh, of facade cells. One of them is square cells, the other one is vertical panels. And uh, the, the tested uh, cells actually, uh, the dimension of these cells is about one meter by one meter in dimensions. And the mechanism of movement of the central point uh, allow it to move a maximum of 40 centimeters in and out, in our direction, outer direction, based on the normal vector of the uh, of the sunlight. And the vertical panels as well has been designed to have uh, one panel, one meter width, and the height of the panel is equivalent to the height of the floor. Uh, and as well, it moves uh, to open and close uh, based on this, uh, uh, the, the, the link with, with the, the data from the uh, sun, sun movement and sun, uh, the solar radiation uh, analysis. So the building was tested, the building that was tested is called Cube in Netherlands. Uh, we have some data about it. Of course, we can do that on any type of building. They just need for comparison of results. And uh, we have here in the paper explain what results we have end up with by testing these two options. And uh, for, for this particular case, option two, which is a panel, uh, get more optimum solution for the to achieve both type of natural light penetration ratio and the, the thermal performance or thermal comfort inside the building. Uh, so in conclusion, we can say that the, 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 the process itself can help the traditional design stages to transform to be more adaptive design workflow and uh, with the advanced technology available at the moment in terms of the, the algorithms the the the, the and the, the use of BIM systems and as well the communication systems, I mean, among the, the design team and the, 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 the interoperability among the tools that we have used uh, for the different type of analysis allow this to, to be, I mean, progressed. Uh, and of course, this will help by the end will, will, will benefit the desired team and the client by the end to get more efficient and more effective solutions for their buildings. And the workflow, uh, while it is has some, some kind of limitation at the moment in terms of the function, the functionality and the, the, the assumptions we have, that we have put in this workflow and the, 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 the rules we, we, which was, was designed have some limitations, but we, we can say that there are, there are rooms for further developments to add more functions, to allow more buildings, more building shapes to be designed and checked, and also to integrate with more artificial intelligence techniques to get a better kind of optimum solutions uh, based on this workflow. So this is thanks you thank you for for your listening and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Abraham. Um, uh, I think that concludes our our session. Um, uh, unless we have any questions coming through, I think it, it really summarised, um, you know, the, the ability and, and the optimization of beam and offsite construction um, 
particularly to, to work in hand in hand. I think you, uh, Abraham's presentation on parametric uh, adaptive design, uh, Mihola's presentation in terms of. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the, the ability to, to connect BIM and offsite will, will really help us in terms of delivering uh, quality uh, quantum housing in the future. And with that, I think we we'll wrap up. We're, we're running slightly over. So thanks everybody for, for tuning in this morning. Thank you.